which we've called Doing Everything Possible, uh, the best thing or the worst thing about American medicine. Uh, for me, uh, this session and the closing one to follow uh, are in many ways uh, even more important than what we've covered so far because these issues uh, will at one time or another affect every American, certainly every American family, uh, but at the same time they don't receive nearly as much uh, public attention or, or policy consideration uh, as the sort of fiscal and quantitative issues that uh, we spent uh, the earlier part of the day on. Um, I want to get a little bit personal uh, for uh, a minute in opening remarks uh, because I believe that there are some anecdotes um, from my own life, and I'm sure that many in the room, if not all, could supply anecdotes from their own lives that really can help uh, frame the difficult questions that, uh, that we want to confront uh, in this session. Uh, in the age of Google, anybody can know almost anything about anybody, so some, some, some of you may know uh, that I've had uh, three children die in infancy uh, from a very rare genetic uh, disease called avular capillary dysplasia. Uh, these children of mine were treated aggressively but also compassionately uh, here at Jefferson uh, but also at St. Christopher's Hospital at CHOP uh, and at Weill Cornell in New York. Um, all three uh, of these uh, babies passed away at about six weeks of age but not before uh, they cost uh, the American health system, cumulatively, millions of dollars. There's no way, no way, if I am never sick a day in my life uh, and I pay the highest insurance premiums possible, uh, that I will ever come close to repaying the dollars that the American health system has spent on my family. I will always be a net taker from the system. Um, I think this personal experience ties to our topic uh, about doing everything possible. And at the same time, the second part, whether or not doing that is the best thing or the worst thing about American medicine. Uh, one of the world's uh, leading studies of, of this d uh, disease I mentioned, ACD, was conducted in Toronto. And its primary purpose was to put Canadian pediatricians and neonatologists on notice about this possible diagnosis when they see certain symptoms in a sick baby. Um, and the purpose of that, having uh, pediatricians be aware of it, was uh, to make sure that they would discontinue treatment when the diagnosis was made. So the point is that under the logic, the economic logic of the Canadian system, uh, if you know that a patient, even a tiny newborn one, is going to die, you shouldn't spend any money on them. I recently spoke to a pediatric intensivist trained in Canada but now practicing in New York who told me that it's routine in Canada to decide how to treat premature babies uh, of all sorts, not just those with this particular disease I mentioned, but premature babies of all sorts based largely on an assessment of whether the mother can have other children. Stop and think about that for a minute and how different that is from the American approach. Likewise, at the other end of life, I have a now 91-year-old father. He's probably lived 25 years on time provided, the last 25 years, time provided by aggressive American medical technology. Multiple bypass surgeries, cancer treatment, an implanted defibrillator, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Countless expensive prescription medications. I wouldn't trade one day or one hour with my father, but he too, uh, even after 91 years of health insurance premiums, is obviously a major net taker from the system. In other countries, perhaps most other countries, many of the services that have been provided to my father, like my children, uh, would have been denied based on their age and their, uh, and their state of frail health. Some would argue uh, that the approach of, this, uh, of the other countries to deny such care is right because the dollars involved could be better spent uh, on preventative uh, or public health um, sorts of approaches that might uh, improve the quality of health of a much greater number of people. On the other hand, many of us would argue uh, that our loved ones and ourselves, if it should come to that, should receive everything possible. So this is tough stuff 
It's the kind of thing that families in the real world face every day in hospitals and in this hospital and in others. We have two uh, distinguished panelists to discuss these issues with us. Uh, Wesley Smith, Senior Fellow at the Discovery Institute's Center on Human Exceptionalism, and Thaddeus Pope, Director uh, of Health Law Institute and Associate Professor of Law at Hamline University School of Law in Minnesota. I'd like you to please join me in welcoming them, and we will get started with their comments. Please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Craig, very much, and thank you all for hanging in for uh, what's going to be a really fun discussion. <laughs> Um, I, I've been involved in these issues for many, many years, assisted suicide, medical futility, health care rationing, and uh, my wife says I'm no fun at parties, so, <laughs> so there we have it. I uh, also uh, want to uh, thank uh, Thaddeus Pope. Uh, I've been wanting to meet uh, Dr. Pope for a long time. He uh, uh, has done tremendous work, even though he and I disagree on some things. Uh, keeping us informed on the latest in medical futility. And if you're interested in these issues, I think uh, Thaddeus Pope's medical futility blog is an absolute essential uh, if you're going to keep up on, on what is happening in the current uh, healthcare system. Uh, I, I've been here since uh, the start of the, just about the start of the session, and I heard a lot of discussion about whether Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, will survive or not survive. But I think it's fair to say that if the ACA dies, Sarah Palin will have killed it. Sarah Palin, when she threw out the political uh, attack, the spear of death panels, uh, I think she dealt what might be a mortal blow, but certainly a very serious blow to the Affordable Care Act, even though she was dead wrong about uh, what she was calling dead panels. She was saying, at first anyway, and uh, my head started to exploding and I started doing a lot of writing to try to, I don't know if she would ever read me, but you're wrong. <laughs> um, but she was saying that the death panels were end of life discussions between physicians and patients, and of course that's ridiculous. Uh, eventually she came to understand that that wasn't exactly what the death panel threat was, and she moved it to the potential for healthcare rationing. Uh, which you now see the term use death panels quite a bit, including articles uh, by people very much in support of the Affordable Care Act uh, uh, in places like the New York Times. Uh, we've seen articles, yes, we need death panels, after being duly upset that someone would call them death panels. But, uh, so I think um, there's a reason why Sarah Palin from Alaska, who many denigrate, uh, actually had probably the most uh, powerful criticism uh, of the ACA and why it resonated so much with the American people. And that's because people are afraid of centralized bureaucrats dictating whether Craig's children can have medical care, whether my 96-year-old mother can have medical care, uh, whether uh, people with disabilities, there was a questioner who said she works with people with disabilities, whether they can have medical care. I can tell you that uh, people, uh, I work very closely uh, with the uh, disability rights community on areas around the assisted suicide issue, which we're really not talking about today. And, and, and uh, they're very concerned that they are the targets of a lot of these agenda items um, in terms of health care rationing, uh, futile care, uh, and, uh, uh, and assisted suicide. Because if you, if you start to look at a quality of life ethic instead of an equality of life ethic, you've, you've broken the back of Hippocratic medical values, uh, and I feel it and worry that you're deprofessionalizing medicine. You're turning it into a technocratic endeavor. I don't think that's good for the country. I don't think that's good for the medical system, and I don't think that's good for patients. I mean, I, I kind of don't like the term service provider. It deprofessionalizes what we're talking about. And I'm not a consumer, I'm a patient. My wife, as it, it happens, went to the doctor today, and, and I was, I've been on, in touch with her. She had a wound uh, that got infected. And it was so comforting to be able to go to our doctor, who we've had for decades, and have him come out and know all about her. And now this was certainly not the kind of serious things we're talking about in this panel, but imagine how much 
how difficult it would be. Again, one of the questions discussed, if, if you are coming to the time of an end-of-life situation and you're unable to access your own doctor. And now, of course, in the hospitals, if you're hospitalized, your own doctor isn't in charge of your care. It's the hospitalist. So we're beginning to see strangers actually having a tremendous impact over the quality of care we receive and perhaps even whether we will receive treatment at all. And I think that becomes becomes a very real problem. And you're also beginning to see with the medical futility issue and the potential of healthcare rationing, coercion being introduced into the healthcare system. And I think that's, that's not going to uh, impact people at, in this room so much because I think we will tend to be more highly educated and, and good consumers, if you will. But I, I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area and we just had the Jahai McMath controversy, which did not deal with medical futility. It dealt with a, a, a tragic case of a girl who, who died uh, after surgery, and it dealt with the brain death issue. In Oakland Children's Hospital, which is a tremendous facility that has offered, that sees the, actually sees their mission as helping the African-American community, minority community of the East Bay quite a bit, and they were immediately distrusted. People began to think that this venerated institution would somehow rush a 13-year-old girl off this mortal coil for financial reasons. So the people who are going to be impacted by the coercive and who I think mostly have been in terms of medical futility disputes, healthcare rationing disputes, and so forth, I think are going to be the people who do not have the good educations, the people who do not understand the system, some of whom will not even speak English. We don't live in a country like Sweden, which is pretty homogeneous. We live in an incredibly hetero, uh, heterogeneous society where, unfortunately, more people know who Kim Kardashian is than Joe Biden. And that certainly impacts us here on these healthcare decisions and, and how we handle them. Uh, I know I only have, I'm a lawyer and I've been given five minutes. <laughs> I'm beginning to twitch here. Uh, and I know we'll, um, we'll, have, we'll have an opportunity uh, to do questions and answers and I think that's going to be good to see where the discussion goes. But I wanted to point out in terms of medical futility uh, what Thaddeus Pope correctly said in one of his recent articles, he's, we're talking about refusing life-sustaining treatment for people, not because the life-sustaining treatment doesn't work, but because it does work. We are talking about refusing efficacious treatment that extends life, because we are beginning to say that even though that has been a fundamental purpose of medicine, extending life, not the only, obviously, but a fundamental purpose of medicine, extending life when that is what the patient wants, when we say that that ain't necessarily so, I think we've turned healthcare and medicine on its head. And as uh, Dr. Pope says, the life-sustaining treatment at issue in most medical futility disputes is, physio is physiologically effective. It can probably sustain the patient's life for some period of time. Consequently, the clinician does not make a purely medical or scientific judgment. Instead, she makes a value-laden judgment. The clinician judges that administering life-sustaining treatment is not worthwhile. Well, how is that the clinician's judgment to make? And that turns informed consent on its rear. And we now see in medical futility disputes the idea that advanced directives can be vetoed. After we've been told, get your advanced directives in, say what you want to do, say what you don't want, and now we're being told, well, that works if you don't want treatment. If you want to, if, it, if it, the time has come to allow nature to take its course, great, that's sacrosanct. But if you want treatment, well, that depends on what we think. I'm saying it in a blunt way because I tend to be a polemicist. I'm not an academic. But I think that's how the American people will perceive it. Because most of us, most of the American people aren't academics either. Finally, I just want to read a quote that I have, uh, that I uh, first came across when I was researching my book, Culture of Death, The Assault on Medical Ethics in America, which Good Grief came out in 2001 about these bioethical issues. It's by Christopher Wilhelm Hufland, uh, 1762 to 1836. 
and uh, he was a, a a very important doctor of, the, of that era from Germany, and he said, quote, if the physician presumes to take into consideration in his work whether a life has value or not, the consequences are boundless, and the physician becomes the most dangerous man in the state. I think there's great wisdom there, and I think we need to ponder whether we want to go down the coercive road. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> First, in case it wasn't obvious, I did want to flag that what you have it in contrast to the first two panels, which I think were mostly physicians and business people, is now two attorneys and bioethicists. Um, and thanks for the plug for my blog. You should, if you want a different perspective, uh, you should check out Wesley on Reason Online. <laughs> In the first session, um, I think she stepped out where the Snapple bottle was there. Uh, the, George, the Georgetown student asked about substitute, or shared decision making. And while it's not a big part of the ACA, um, although it does fund through, um, uh, CMMI and the uh, AHRQ, uh, some demonstration projects, it is a really important development. Um, and it's unfolding especially more rapidly at the state level, especially in the state of Washington. And so I want to I want to cycle back to that. Um, Thirteen years ago, there's a really famous uh, case from a Dutch neonatal intensive care unit. Uh, infant girl was born with an extremely severe skin disorder in which basically anything that touches the skin caused severe peeling, basically equivalent to a severe burn. So in effect, the baby had a majority of her skin affected, the equivalent of basically an 80 to 90 percent uh, burn. No known cure, no effective therapy, right? And the baby's pain and suffering was intractable, untreatable, and unbearable. Consequently, both the parents as well as the clinicians agreed that it was in the baby's best interest to withhold potentially life-sustaining treatment. And that's an extreme case where the burdens extremely outweigh the benefits. Many other cases, admittedly, are not uh, so clear. But fortunately, in most cases, we don't need to make those sorts of benefit burden trade-offs or balances on the basis of objective best interest analysis like we do for newborn infants. Instead, we can let patients themselves make these trade-offs, right? So a lot of the expensive and toxic cancer drugs that we provide don't help, pe help people feel any better. They don't help people live any longer. There's zero benefit. There's really nothing. There's no trade-off to make. But let's say that there is some benefit, right? So that there is a trade-off to make. We know in survey after survey after survey that most people, 70% or more of people, would trade length of life for quality of life. 70% of people would prefer to die at home, not in an ICU. But in fact, in reality, only 20% people die at home and a lot of people die in the ICU or at least in a regular hospital ward. So this is, this is my opening point, my theme, like, uh, is that doing everything possible, to go to the, the question, um, really may be the worst thing in American medicine if, if everything is not what the patient wants and usually it's not, right? We don't have to look too far, I think it's this way, but if you just look across the river, in New Jersey, right, which has long topped the list for the highest spending per patient, on, on, for Medicare spending, um, in terms of end of life spending, right, more ICU days, more specialist visits in the last year of life and in the last month of life, right, are New Jersey patients sicker? No. Does this extra treatment help them live any longer? No. Does it help them live any better? No. But most importantly, do they even want this extra treatment? No. So we may need to deny treatment, and we'll, and we'll come to this, right? We may need to deny treatment that is both effective and wanted, um, but we can do a whole lot of good by first stop providing treatment that's ineffective and unwanted. Um, and that's why I think it's important, the point earlier in the first session about shared decision making, uh, because there's robust evidence, and Dr. Emanuel referenced it briefly um, from the group health studies, um, that giving patients decision aids such as uh, videos and interactive websites really 
dramatically improves their understanding and appreciation of what exactly uh, the proposed treatment is about. And once they have that more enhanced understanding, overwhelmingly they don't, they choose less aggressive interventions, they choose less medicine, and they have better outcomes. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so I, it's clear we have a, um, a fundamental disagreement on, on an issue that is in fact fundamental. Um, let's, see if, let's see if we can explore it a little more and, and maybe find uh, some common ground. Uh, I, I think that um, uh, you've pointed to evidence that I think is, is, is absolutely clear that a majority of Americans say uh, they don't want extraordinary measures taken to extend their lives that, 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 uh, that do not give them an additional quality of life. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's absolutely clear that a majority of Americans have made it clear they don't want a, uh, a third party, and particularly the government, making the decision as to when that happens. Is there a way, I mean, is the country just essentially, you know, uh, uh, cognitively dissonant on this issue? We believe two things at the same time that can't be squared? But I think those are perfectly consistent. Um, I totally agree uh, with what uh, Thaddeus said in terms of people who don't want that kind of treatment shouldn't be forced to receive it. I think one of the great contributions of the bioethics movement has been the right to refuse unwanted medical care. Uh, and that was started uh, actually by somebody who believed in the sanctity of human life, a Christian uh, bioethicist named Paul Ramsey, who said that was to not treat the patient as a person. You don't stick, when, when somebody's a, an independent person, you don't stick unwanted tubes in their body. You don't force them to be in an ICU. Uh, I think it's very important to understand that, that if one disagrees that people should be, uh, with the proposition that people should be forced off that kind of treatment when they want it, does not make one a vitalist to say that one must receive it even if they don't. Uh, I'm not a Catholic, but even the Catholic Church doesn't hold to that position. And in fact, Pope John Paul II, uh, when his end came, did not go after the last nth degree of treatment that might have been available to keep him going a few extra re weeks. So I don't think that what Thaddeus said and what I said are, are uh, in conflict at all in that regard. So I'll just point to one specific. This is a re at the end of 2013, the Pew study, uh, the Pew Charitable Foundation issued a survey results that basically um, said what I said, which is 70% of people don't want uh, they don't want to do everything possible. That was actually the question. Would you want to, if doctors said there's nothing, there's no hope, would you still want to do everything possible? 70% of people said no. Um, but importantly, 30% of people actually said yes. And actually, when you break that down, right, uh, for example, if you just look at Hispanic Catholics, it's 66% said yes, we do want to do everything possible, or black Protestants, 50%. So those are really high numbers. Um, so what I, my solution, which is if we just give people the treatment that they want, match treatment to, to, to preferences, um, then, every, then we, uh, everybody's happy. But unfortunately, um, there are people who really do want, um, at least according to the surveys, everything possible. Um, and it's not clear that physicians are willing to provide that treatment or that payers are willing to pay for it. But I think that that's a bit misleading because it's pretty abstract, but if when you get into the actual circumstance, uh, you tell somebody when they've got metastatic cancer that if they get CPR, it's going to break their ribs, uh, I think you find a lot fewer people actually say that everything possible. In fact, I think I read in one of your articles that of the, con the disputes over ICU that occur, and of course most ICU treatment withdrawal decisions are not disputed, they're worked through, that you said only about 5% of those end up being coming intractable. So we're not talking about 30% of people being forced off care that they want, actually. We're talking about a, a really, I think, relatively small number of people. Uh, secondly, I've noticed that 40% of people in this country die under hospice care. I think there's a problem that they're not in hospice long enough, and I think that's something we need to discuss. But I don't think that it says that, uh, that 
people are, are really intent, intent on aggressive care. Because when you think about it, of the people who die, how many die after a sudden heart attack or a stroke or get hit by a train, this kind of thing? That's a, that's a large percentage. I don't know what the exact number is, but let's say that's 40%. That takes that whole idea of end of life treatment decision making, a lot of that off the table. And a lot of the people who do die in the intensive care unit will fall into those kinds of categories where, where somebody has a stroke and you don't know whether the, uh, perhaps whether the treatment is going to help or not, or somebody's been shot and you don't know whether the treatment's going to help or not. I warrant that very few people, say with terminal cancer, uh, when they're coming to the end of the life that's expected, end up in the ICU. I'm sure it happens on occasion, but I bet it doesn't happen very often. I, I was thinking as, as last night when I couldn't sleep because I'm on California time, uh, how many of the people that I've known who've died since 1978 when my grandmother died in a hospital bed but not in the ICU after she'd had a stroke, uh, how many people do I know that died in intensive care? And I've known, you know, I'm, you can see the color of my hair, the number of people who I've known who have died are increasing. I only know one, and that was a, a very good friend of my wife's and myself, who died two weeks after giving birth after a massive unexpected heart attack at age 39. And she, of course, was brought to the hospital. They did a bypass. She went into cardiac arrest. The doctor actually, uh, her husband called me, and so I was there for this whole horrible tragedy. And the doctor came in and told us that they'd spent 25 minutes trying to restart her heart and succeeded. Uh, and he said, now the question is, what, if, if she can live the next 24 hours, then we'll see about the next week. Then we'll see if she's alive, whether she ever becomes awake again. Uh, and eventually she died a few hours later in intensive care when her husband finally and properly said enough. It's, uh, we've seen, we saw the paddles going twice. And it was more than, than anyone should have to take. And more than those poor nurses uh, should, I mean, what they do, the heroics of those nurses, was unbelievable. But, but she died in the ICU, and I think not improperly so. You know, after that event, I went to thank the nurses who were so calm and professional in their work, and then I realized when I said to one of the nurses, thank you, and she turned on me, and her eyes were wild, and I realized, my God, that's a fight. Those nurses suppress their emotions, but it's there. So, would they have been that wild-eyed if it had been Grandma Agnes at age 98? No, because that's a natural part of life. But I think we, we have to be careful not to fall into easy falsehoods about, well, 30% want everything done. Well, that's easy to say until you're in that situation. Then I think the actual number who actually truly insist that everything be done uh, shrinks quite a bit. And then the question becomes, is the distrust you will sow by denying that very small amount, perhaps inappropriate ICU, is that worth uh, the distrust, worth the fact that maybe somebody can be uh, taken out of the ICU uh, a little earlier than they would uh, otherwise be in terms of dying? Let's talk about, the, about the healthcare rationing. Um, so I, I think it's, it's indisputable that in most other advanced countries, there are fairly clear, bright lines about things like the age at which you can have a bypass, the age at which uh, you can do kidney dialysis, the length of time you can do kidney dialysis, and a variety of, of, of these other things that, again, in our country, that the tradition has been to allow that to be a private decision between the individual, the individual's family, and the physician. Uh, and uh, to, to have, in many cases, those kinds of interventions go on almost indefinitely, hip, hip replacements at 90 and so on. Um, is, is, the, is the benefit of that to the individuals involved uh, worth the social cost? When we talk about, uh, we all saw the, the, the graph earlier, uh, the, the, uh, the single greatest driver of the federal budget deficit being health care spending, the single largest portion of that being uh, end of life and other kinds of extraordinary care. Uh, so are we, are we as a society paying too much for those unlimited interventions? Um, I, I think there's a false premise there. I think end of life care 
uh, is about, of the total health care budget, not talking about the Medicare budget, but the total health care budget is 10 to 15 percent, something like that, for end-of-life care. At least it was, the last time I researched, it was 10 to 12 percent of the entire health care budget. It's certainly much more of the Medicare budget. Uh, I, I think it's 30 or 40 percent of the Medicare budget, which are two different things. And of course, one would expect uh, that uh, end-of-life uh, costs would go up on Medicare um, because people are coming to the end of their life. Um, I think if we're going to have a professional health care system, we have to treat people as individuals. My mother received a health uh, a HEP replacement. It's the only uh, surgery she's ever had other than uh, on, on the government's dime. Uh, I was born by a cesarean, but that I guess my dad paid for, maybe brought a chicken to the doctor. It was that long ago. <laughs> uh, but that, that's really been the, and then other than that, she's uh, got a couple of uh, eye drops for glaucoma, and, and that's been the extent. I mean, I hope I have her genes. It's unbelievable. Uh, my wife and I just were sick with a terrible cold for a month. My mom had it for three days. It's, uh, it's an astonishing thing. But she was treated as an individual at 78 when she got the hip replacement, and it's lasted now till she's 96. No, I'm sorry, she was 88, and it's lasted now back again, 82. Should she have been denied that hip replacement because she was over the age of 80? I think not. Th that hip replacement, when she could only hobble 100 yards when she had it, and she did it when it was, there was really no choice, um, until the last year, when now she's on a walker, she's been able to walk a couple of miles. So should she have been arbitrarily denied that surgery because of her age? I'd say no, and I don't think anyone should. If she had been a frail person, I think the surgeon would have said, I don't think you're capable of withstanding the difficulties of this hip replacement. So I think we need to try to work really hard to continue to treat people as individuals, particularly since this is not Europe, and Americans do have a more individualistic sense, perhaps a sense of entitlement, but we do have a more individualistic culture. And I think a healthcare system has to reflect the culture in which it operates. So uh, the premise of your question is whether or not we really need to eliminate some choices or, or ban them, right? And I, and I uh, so Bill Frist was making this point earlier about that compared to health care in medicine, our health is far more driven by public health measures like what we eat and, and our behavior than, than health care. Um, and so let me analogize to that because um, in public health, right, we don't want to ban choices, right? So we, we could uh, ban sodas and, and, and things like that to improve health, but we don't do that, right? Before we start with those sort of hard measures, we start with soft measures like just menu labeling and measures that are basically directed at improving the, um, empowering the consumer to make a more informed choice. And if we do the same thing here, right, which is, again, with, with better patient decision aids, um, when people better understand what the long odds are, what the side effects are of these uh, proposed interventions, most people decline them, right? Because they don't want to take those, si those kinds of odds. Um, so it's not clear that we need to move to hard measures because soft measures may very well work. And we're just now really moving um, to really rolling out better um, informed consent measures to make, basically making sure people really understand what the options are. And a lot of people, a lot of the population we're talking about is incapacitated at the time these treatment decisions are made. So the treatment decisions are being made by surrogates more than half of the time. And so we need to really be better focus on empowering surrogates to make decisions because surrogates unfortunately have a high error rate and make way more aggressive decisions than patients would make for themselves if they still had capacity to make their own decisions. Um, Another thing that we can do to, again, a soft measure, to preclude the need for a hard measure, um, is change the defaults, right? And we know um, from rapidly developing uh, evidence from the behavioral and economics world, you don't take the choice away, but you change the default, right? Because when, when people are lazy, basically, and once you, you give them a default, like, so you, people don't save enough for retirement, so you just basically say, we're automatically contributing X percent into your 401k. You can opt out, but most people don't. So you make the default, what's the better thing to do? So one quick example, um, CPR, right? Everybody is presumed to consent to and want uh, to cardiopulmonary resuscitation unless you specifically opt out. Um, but for a lot of elderly, sick, 
hospital inpatients, there's less than 3% chance that it's actually going to be effective. So it's sort of a weird thing to default to something that most people don't want, um, and it probably isn't going to work, right? So make the default um, DNR um, and let people opt back in. And just right down the street, Scott Halpern at Penn, right, did a study where he randomized people into uh, DNR or uh, <laughs> CPR, and most of the people who were defaulted into DNR didn't change, right? When they were said, this is what, this is what we did. We, we randomized you into this. Do you want to change? Like, no, that's good. I'll stick, right? And so people, defaults are sticky, right? And so we should make, we should change the defaults. It doesn't take the choice away. You can opt out, um, but we should make the defaults what happens to correlate with what most people want and what is probably going to produce better quality health care. How, how do you feel? How do you feel about changing the defaults? Does, does that uh, violate uh, our certainly? I think on uh, uh, DNRs that would that would be problematic. I mean, how do you decide who gets the default non-DNR and who doesn't? Um, I I just find that very problematic. I do think though that people need to stop being afraid to have these discussions in their families, and people do need to start creating, I, I don't like living wills because that kind of says this is what I want under these conditions and usually you're not going to know uh, what, what that particular condition you find yourself in when you become incompetent. Realize these only take effect when you can't make your own decisions. I do believe very strongly in the durable power of attorney for health care. That's what we call it in California. I don't know what it's called here. Where you have appointed somebody to be your legal surrogate and you've told them what your desires are. I had a case where I was asked to be a legal surrogate for somebody who wanted to do something that I found, I won't get into the details, that I found I couldn't do morally, and I told him that. So he got a different surrogate. Isn't that how it should work? Um, rather than have suddenly people come up with the, the sudden crisis and, and people maybe feeling guilty because they didn't visit grandma enough, uh, so they want to make sure that she knows that she loves that that they love her and they they decide to go full code for uh, for until the nth degree. So these I think um, I think the uh, these the increasing discussion about advanced directives is good for our society. Uh, I don't have a lot to good to say about the assisted suicide movement, but I will say one of the positives of that movement has been there has been a greater focus on end of life. Uh, which perhaps would not have been there otherwise, although I think the hospice movement uh, certainly uh, should have been able to, and if it got more attention, might be able to accomplish that. I think, by the way, another thing that we could do is for hospice, I, I had the great honor of interviewing Dame Cecily Saunders, uh, who is the creator of the modern hospice movement, one of the great medical humanitarians of the 20th century, and I got to go to St. Christopher's Hospice, which was the first modern hospice that she founded. And she's the one who, who founded St. Christopher's then moved it out in hospice care into the community where people die at home and then brought it over here, I think, to Yale in 72 and so forth. And um, she said the biggest mistake that we in the United States made around hospice was to force people to say either you're in hospice or you have an opportunity for... Uh, curative treatment. She said, and these were the words she, she used, she said, that's like telling people, abandon hope all ye who enter here. And she's got a really good point. She said, in England, they don't have that, and most people go into hospice, do not choose because they're in hospice, they, oh, I want that last ditch chemo. But knowing that it's a potentially available if they want it, encourages more people to enter hospice. So I think that we can do the things, the default settings, for example, uh, should be doctors recommending, not forcing. How many doctors don't talk to their terminally ill cancer patients about hospice? How many of them just say, because they, if they find it too difficult to talk about that the patient is terminal? When my dad was dying, I went into the room, and, and this was before HIPAA, so the doctor talked to me about my dad's condition. And he looked at me and said, son, the doctor didn't use the word terminal. And I said, well, dad, he did with me. I mean, why should that be? Doctors need to, if you can't, if you're going to be an oncologist or if you're going to deal with some of these very difficult issues and you can't talk to your patient 
about the fact that maybe it's time to have that discussion, then maybe you need to get another line of work because people have a right to understand these things and they need to have these discussions so they can begin to prepare. And these, these uh, policies to pay doctors to have end-of-life treatment discussions, I saw one in the Senate, it said once a year, but that's not how life works. You have a discussion, then you try some treatment, maybe it didn't work, then you have another discussion. I mean, this should be part of basic medicine, having these discussions. Uh, but perhaps that's a, a story for another panel. Can I, I, how many people have an advanced directive? All right, well, this is obvious, this does, that's great, because it I mean, obviously doesn't match the overall population. So, right, and so on the Affordable Care Act, right, the, the, death, the original death panel debate was about the voluntary advanced care planning coverage, right, which would have paid physicians more to have the end of life because it, there's an opportunity cost for the oncologist to take that time now. She can make a lot more money just prescribing more drugs than taking the 45 or an hour and a half to talk with you about your end of life options. Um, and right, and Re Representative Blumenauer has in tr tried in the years since the ACA to try to um, add in that Medicare payment coverage. Fortunately, at the state level, where most law pertaining to the regulation of medicine happens, not at the federal level. The states like New York, Vermont, Michigan, California have mandated, right, because it's not happening, uh, mandated uh, clinicians to have these end-of-life discussions. So once the, the patient is diagnosed as terminally ill, you have to talk to them about hospice, about palliative care, and about their other end-of-life options, because it wasn't happening um, until maybe like 10 days before death, where you finally say, well, it's really not working out, um, which is way, way too late. Um, and so since basically the medical profession wasn't uh, self-regulating uh, appropriately, um, state legislatures basically had to step in and mandate and write down, I guess we have the American College of Physicians right there, you know, issued a really strong report like, well, you're really, you know, stepping in and interfering with the practice of medicine, you really ought to leave that to us. Well, you really dropped the ball, you know, you really should have been having these discussions. Um, you weren't doing it, so unfortunately, uh, you weren't, your self-regulation wasn't working, we had to step in and tell you to do it. Questions from the audience? We've got uh, a little bit uh, less than a half an hour. So I am Tony, I'm actually a lawyer, lawyer of four states, civil rights. But what struck me, the gentleman left when he said New Jersey. I can't hear you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm an attorney in New Jersey and a few other states, but what struck me is the gentleman on the left talked about New Jersey. But I had an experience where I represented an Orthodox Jewish gentleman that was mentally disabled. His mom uh, was under the care of the state of New Jersey, and they decided to take uh, feeding tubes from, him, from her. And what was frightening about the case was the administration of the hospital wanted to take away the feeding tubes. The state of New Jersey did, notwithstanding the doctor's tent and the uh, nurse's tent. And then under Orthodox Judaism, it's considered a sin to do that. You know, and I'm not going to get a debate about religion. But th that what scares me is administrators making these decisions yeah. with, pr with undue pressure, number one. Number two, I think why New Jersey has probably a higher incident, I think it's, eth uh, it's our ethnicity of our state. We have Italian Americans, Irish, Catholics, Jews, Puerto Ricans, uh, black folks, and they're going to go to bat for their parents and grandparents more so than, let's say, South Carolina, where I'm also a lawyer, which is more of a Anglo-Saxon, Scotch-Irish type viewpoint. And, and what also got me was I was shocked when I started doing this right to life issue with this one particular case, and I don't do this type of law. But I was shocked about the different viewpoints of Northern uh, Europe versus Southern Europe. With the Dutch, if you want to kill yourself, it's no problem. But that doesn't happen in Italy or Portugal or Spain. So I see the, a lot of this is based on uh, our backgrounds, really. And, but what scared me the most was the fact that the administrator and the state of New Jersey really pushed it. And I just threatened to sue them and cut the top. Uh, there's a great... Uh, professor at Yeshiva University about these end-of-life issues, Orthodox Jew, and he just explained straight out sin under Orthodox Judaism. So they, they blinked, thank God. But, but what got me was the doctors were really, let's help, while the administration and the state was, let's push, push, push. So, that's so, what, so, that, so that goes back to the question of the, the who decides question, right? So 
if you could, if you could both. Right. So okay. um, just quickly, so at least it's pretty well established. If you look to the, the, the best, most robust evidence where people really examine the spending data is the Dartmouth Atlas. And the reason that New Jersey spends more is really because it's overbedded, right? And it's basically once you build it, you really have to fill it, right? That, I mean, that's, that's pretty well established. On, on the case, right, I'll give you, I, I agree with you, right? And I actually did appear on the patient side in a case just like this. This went up to the New, it's published opinion New Jersey appellate courts um, in the Betancourt case. And there the um, patient was per, uh, permanently uh, unconscious and had depended on a whole bunch of stuff, including dialysis. And the hospital, this is uh, Trinit, uh, Trinitas Hospital in Elizabeth, New Jersey, wanted to stop the dialysis. Family didn't want to stop the dialysis. Um, Notably, in the, once we got to the appellate courts, the New Jersey Hospital Association and the Medical Society of New Jersey came in as amicus parties. Um, and what they asked from the appellate court of New Jersey was this. They said, look, you should defer to us. We've decided, we the clinicians and the, and the ethics committee at this hospital have decided that this is inappropriate and you should defer to our judgment on this and, and not interfere. Well. Notably, the reason the patient was in a permanent vegetative state is because um, his endotracheal tube had become dislodged. Looked very probable because of negligence that maybe he should have been restrained. Um, and he had, at the, by this point in time, exhausted his total cap of Medicare inpatient days. Um, and the evidence showed that it was a, a, a top-down, meaning the, the CEO had asked, why is that guy still in my ICU, right? Um, it was a financially motivated decision. So the, the appellate court uh, the appellate division in New Jersey rightly said, we don't think so, right? There's way too much baggage in this case, meaning the financial, the conflict of interest, and we're not going to let you um, decide yourselves when it's time uh, to stop life-sustaining treatment. Uh, I, think, okay, uh, I think you brought up a very important point about the Judaism, and it shows the diversity of our society. And I think uh, one of the things that has made this country work is comedy, the ability to kind of uh, allow people to be, have different opinions on these issues. Um, I, I'm very much against internal feudal care determinations. Uh, what often, um, for example, the state of Texas has a law that allows uh, when a doctor believes that uh, ICU intervention is inappropriate, uh, and if the patient or the fam, usually the surrogate disagrees, then a, a bioethics committee meeting will be called. And uh, if the bioethics committee decides that the treatment should be terminated, the patient is given 10 days within which to find another institution. And of course, that usually proves impossible because we're talking about expensive to care for patients, as Thaddeus was just describing. And the uh, CEO in that other hospital doesn't want that ICU patient in his hospital or her hospital. Uh, and, and I think it, it works a very real injustice. Um, I think if we're going to have those kinds of disputes, they belong in court. I hate to say it. But if it is truly, um, usually these things are couched in terms of causing too much suffering to the patient and guilt-ridden family members who just refuse to let go. Well, if a patient, if continuing a patient's treatment really does constitute a form of abuse or neglect. It belongs in open court where the society, because we all, we all have stakes in those kinds of disputes, can see it, it can be reported, there can be appeals, and so forth. So I don't believe in these private futility dispute uh, administrative proceedings. I represented a client once. I don't practice actively anymore, but back when I still was, I took a pro bono case of a woman whose husband had done two things. He'd signed a living will basically saying, if I'm unconscious, I don't want care. He didn't know that it would include feeding tube because a lot of people don't know that a feeding tube is medical treatment. They think it's just food and water, even though it's a form of medical treatment, as we saw in the Terry Schiavo situation, that can be refused or withdrawn like any other medical intervention. And he also then signed a durable power of attorney naming his wife to be his surrogate. And he had Alzheimer's disease, and the doctor thought that he was unconscious. And he demanded that the feeding tube be taken out, and the wife said, no, I've signed a uh, DNR, do not resuscitate order. I have said no antibiotics, but I know my husband. He was a devout Christian. He would not want the feeding tube removed. 
The doctor got furious with her and called a, a um, and this was at an HMO, uh, and he called a uh, bioethics meeting and I went to represent her and it was intimidating for me. I mean, you had this big horseshoe with about 20 people around. They all are talking together. They all know each other. They all reflect, reflected the institutional culture. The doctor was well known being patted on the back. And here we were kind of sitting there looking, really feeling <laughs> very small. And it turns out that the wife had, because she had durable power of attorney, would not allow the doctor to do the test to prove that the patient was unconscious so he could remove the feeding tube. And I made the point in the, in the uh, meeting, why do you want to do all of these expensive tests on a man with Alzheimer's disease? And the doctor kind of went, ah, uh, because he didn't want to admit it so I could pull the feeding tube. And, and then I did the same kind of dramatic thing. If you pull the feeding tube, I, we will sue, blah, blah, blah. And uh, because it was a mediating uh, committee rather than a quasi-judicial decision-making committee, we were able to come up with a common sense solution. We changed doctors. And I got a call from her about three years later. He died, th he lived another three years, and she had the comfort of knowing that he wasn't pushed. And I think that's important. Uh, it's, it was important for you that your babies were not pushed. There was a case out of uh, uh, Canada, I think it's the baby Joseph case, and the baby uh, had a genetic disease and was dying, and the doctors at the, uh, I think it was in, uh, may have been in um, Ottawa, but I'm not sure of the exact place, they said, we're not going to, we want this child off of life support. So the parents said, fine, give us a, a, a tracheotomy so we can have a ventilator and take him home and take care of him, and they said no to that too. The baby was taken home and lived another six months and then died. Was that inappropriate care for that child? No. Both for the child, because we don't want to say that, that uh, giving treatment that allows families to care for their loved ones is inappropriate. And it was, and, it, and of course the decision shouldn't be about family members, but it was certainly appropriate for the family to be able to take their baby home. So these are the kinds of things that we're getting into, and the, the things that make the, the news are, are the very rare cases of almost the extreme circumstances. Most of these, and I think that case was a, a clear case of abuse of, of, the, of the physician's prerogative there, particularly when the family gave them a way out that was reasonable. Um, in the Jahai McMath case, getting back, which isn't what we're talking about, but the judge there, I was so impressed because Oakland Hospital said, we are not ethically going to treat this little girl like she's alive. You cannot force us to treat her as if she's a living patient when she's not. The California law says there has to be a time of reasonable accommodation when a brain death has been declared. And what the judge did is we did not force the Oakland Hospital to violate their ethics, but he also permitted the family at their own expense and those of their supporters to take what I consider to be Jahai's body. I don't talk about that in public because there are people who, whose hearts are involved in this, but they took Jahai, and the, he, she's someplace on the East Coast uh, being maintained, and I'm very close to Terry Shivo's family who were involved in that case. We had difference of opinion on that one, and she's still being maintained, but it, she's being maintained on the family and her uh, charitable supporters dime. That is the kind of comedy that I think we're capable of as a society, although that did not involve technically an end-of-life care situation. So, uh, Robert Field, Drexel University. Um, this is partly in the nature of a comment, but I'd like to hear both of your reactions to it. We talk about rationing, and we always talk about the high end, the end-of-life treatments, the expensive high-tech treatments, uh, which is what the, the British model is. <laughs> Do we have a form of backdoor rationing here where we provide the high-end care, but it's really at the expense of primary care and public health? Uh, in Europe, uh, they deny the expense of care, but then they have more advanced primary care systems and more involved public health infrastructures. Here, when we spend the money because someone wants everything possible done, where does that money come from? Well, some of it comes from less nursing staff, uh, lower pay for primary care physicians, uh, fewer public health measures. Um, isn't part of the cost of this really reverse rationing? 
Well, that kind of question always upsets me a little bit because it seems to me what's really going on in the society is that we're expanding what is considered health care. Uh, we're expanding it almost beyond uh, uh, the point where it's even recognizable. Uh, in my state of California, they've just passed a law that requires that all gay and lesbians, and this isn't a moral statement, but it's about money, that all gay and lesbians who want infertility treatments and are on group health insurance have the right to it, whether or not they're actually infertile. Whereas in, for heterosexuals, you have to prove you're infertile either by being unable to conceive for a year or for a diagnosis. Well, so we're now in California providing a very expensive medical treatment for a group of the population that may actually not have a pathology. Um, you take a look at in, in the UK, uh, they permit 42-year-old women who can't conceive to have IVF on the NHS's dime. But a woman who's 42 can't conceive is not necessarily having a pathology, it's age. It's a natural thing. In our country, how many billions did I read that we spent so that 75-year-old men can pretend to be 18? I mean, that's ridiculous. I, I, it seems to me that if we're going to start saying we're going to put limits on, you start at things like Viagra rather than, uh, or penal pumps. I mean, I couldn't believe how much was spent on that. On Medicare, I mean, that's, that's just a natural part of aging. Um, rather than on uh, uh, people who are wanting non-elective, what used to be called non-elective procedures. I also don't think necessarily that public health initiatives should be considered in looking at this, like you know, advertising not to smoke, advertising not to be obese. Now, I understand there's a correlation with what Dr. Frist talked about, the 40%, but I'm not sure that, that we should try to lump the monies we spend on those efforts and medical treatment together. That's just something I hadn't really considered too much until you asked your question. I, don't, I mean, I don't know that there's a trade-off like that, like just because you spent it here comes from here, right? It probably... Um, it really is just debt, right? I mean, so all, all of this, most of this is, is just is becoming debt. Um, we can't really afford Medicare and Medicaid now, it's, except for the fact that it's, we're borrowing to, to pay for it. Um, but I do think that your point about decentralized, um, what happens, and, and maybe a bigger danger, is that since we're not doing it, it, like you're saying, in some of these other countries, in an upfront, open, and transparent manner, it's being done, and, mm -hmm. but in a very decentralized way. And what's scary about that is, and the literature shows this, there's extreme variability from hospital to hospital and even from clinician to clinician in the same hospital, right? As to like, well, do I do offer this surgery to a 90 year old or do I keep this person in the ICU? And so it's, it's not good to have that level of variability um, in, in the healthcare system. And so I think it would, it would, that's what I feel is a bigger danger from not being upfront and open and transparent about yeah. it. Not to mention variability in what insurance plan you have. Uh, well, what, what HMO is managing your care. Right, well, yeah, yeah I didn't even, yeah, so uh, even adding the, the payer in as well, but even at the clinician, even when it's being paid for, right, sometimes, um, I mean, we, we heard earlier, you know, there's a move from fee-for-service to, to more outcome-based payment, um, but even when it's being paid for, clinicians just out of a sense of integrity or to avoid moral distress don't want to provide even compensated care. And they would, lots of intensivists, critical care docs would say, I could make a lot of money if I did this, but I just don't think it's right, right? So even notwithstanding whether or not there's a reimbursement source for that treatment, uh, at the clinician level, at, at the provider level, they just don't want to do it because they don't think it's right. They actually feel complicit in, in, uh, in, in torture. I mean, they use the word torture, right? Because they feel like we're just doing stuff to their body and it's not making them any better. It's, it's, it's all burden, no benefit. That's not what I went to medical school for. Thank you. Please. Hi, um, my name is Victoria. I'm a nursing student from Villanova University and I also work at the Children's Hospital. Um, so I've personally seen patients receive expensive procedure after expensive procedure with little to no improvements. Um, where do you see the use of palliative care going in today's healthcare system? When do you think it should become part of the patient's healthcare conversation? And how do you think it could improve our system? Uh, I think we need to expand palliative care, uh, certainly. And I, think, I don't think somebody should have to be, have a terminal diagnosis uh, to receive it. There are a lot of people with very chronic conditions uh, who would benefit from palliative care. 
Uh, I, I think the people, I've been a hospice volunteer and I've seen this in action. Uh, the, the hospice nurses, I mean, they make house calls. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really wonderful. And what we have to do is help people get past the idea, and that was what Dame Cecily Saunders was saying. If we take away the idea that you, that you have to get rid of everything else to receive palliative care, which is more efficient and I think is cost effective, I think you'd see more people getting onto it because people want to have a good quality of life and they don't want to be in pain. But we kind of force them into these terrible draconian choices. So I would like to, to make palliative care broader and, and, and more open to people other than those who are terminally ill. Well, I absolutely agree. And let me, just to go back to the theme of the day, which is Obamacare, one thing about the Affordable Care Act that and this, our, our session here is a lot about, you know, what, how might we need to restrain choice and constrict choice. Um, one thing about the ACA that expanded choice uh, pertains to hospice specifically, right? So historically, the hospice benefit under Medicare um, require what's well, still it requires an election, right? So if you if you choose hospice, then you you have to forego the curative um, directed treatments um, for the terminal illness. Um, the Affordable Care Act got rid of that, at least with respect to Medicaid, for children and, and authorized demonstration projects to get rid of the election um, for adults with an eye toward it will probably prove and then we might change it once the demonstration project results come back. Right? So you can have concurrent hospice and still continue because what happens is people don't want to give up on the curative measures until it's really, really, really clear that there's, nothing, there's no, there's no um, opportunity for reversal left. And as, as Wesley said a few minutes ago, people go on hospice just three days, five days before death, which is too late uh, to benefit. For absolutely, um, both hospice and palliative care more broadly uh, should, should be greatly expanded. Definitely. Thank you. Please. Hi. My name is Hannah Gertis. I'm a pre-medical student, uh, sophomore at Georgetown University. Um, I was wondering, we talked a lot about um, how patients don't often want treatment until the bitter end, uh, the most aggressive treatment they can receive, and how that can be not economically wise in some cases. Um, but what about situations in which the morally controversial decision is the more economically uh, viable decision, such as um, Belgium recently legalized child euthanasia and the question of um, even mentally ill people opting for euthanasia? like. Those sorts of situations in which the controversial d choice would be the one that actually ends life sooner. Um, does your, do your answers change when that reverse situation is the case? Oh, now you're looking for a one hour speech. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I, my first book in these issues dealt with euthanasia-assisted suicide, and, and when I researched it, I went to the Netherlands, and I, I discussed, uh, interviewed people who were both pro-euthanasia and anti-euthanasia over there. And one of the things that I found very interesting was that the pro-euthanasia Dutch, including Dr. Admiral, who just recently died, I spoke to him on the phone, but even the others, they said, this will work here in the Netherlands because we do not have a money-driven healthcare system. But if you try it in the United States, you're looking for real trouble because your healthcare system is so money-driven. And I, I found that very interesting. And one of the arguments I began to make very early on in my efforts uh, against assisted suicide was the HMO argument, which I think is very important, that it might cost $1,000 to give someone assisted suicide and $100,000 to make it so they don't want it. Uh, it's, um, it's a very serious situation, I think, in terms of economics. Uh, in Oregon, which has specifically rationed Medicaid, there were two cases, Barbara Wagner and Randy Stroops, in, in 2008, in which uh, Barbara Wagner had terminal lung cancer and Randy Stroops uh, terminal prostate cancer. And their oncologist prescribed life-extending chemotherapy, not life, not curative, but chemotherapy that would extend the life nine months a year, something like that. And they both wanted it. The state of Oregon sent them both letters saying, no, we will not pay for the life-extending chemotherapy because of our ration Medicaid, but we will pay for your assisted suicide. So I do think that's something to consider very carefully. 
Uh, and of course, the, the thought of, well, if I go now, then Timmy can go to college is another issue to consider. So, right, we have this expression, right? You, normally, you can't have your cake, you need it too. But this is like one of those t exceptions, right? We really can, right? So hospice, palliative care um, really do produce better outcomes, higher patient satisfaction, and they happen to cost less, right? Just, it's like good, too good to be true almost, but it really is. We have death panels, right? We have real, I mean, Wesley refer, mentioned the uh, Texas Advanced Directive, the ethics committees in Texas, which basically can unilaterally deny life-sustaining treatment, and it's unreviewable in court, their form of last resort. There's tons of other examples, right? UNOS, right? We don't have enough organs for all the people who need organs. They have to decide who's gonna get the organ, right? So they're really, they're making life and death decisions. And it may so happen that the decisions that they make happen to save money, right? But you're at Georgetown, so you remember Aquinas, right, had the doctrine of double effect, right? So it's perfectly okay if the reason for the decision is not to save money, but it's just it's for whatever other end you're doing. And it's okay if it happens to be a double effect, a, con a side effect of the decision. So we have to structure these panels, these tribunals, um, such that they are make, they're open, transparent, fairly constituted, um, such that they're making decisions, um, not the decisions that would necessarily just save the most money, but they're making, they happen to save money, that's okay, but they have to be constituted to make fair and rational decisions. Thank you. Please. So I just want to ask you how, so I agree with you that the patient's family, the patient and the physician should be in on the discussion as to what the end of life kind of care should be or when treatment should be withheld. But the only thing I can say is that the way treatments and their effectiveness is presented can really influence a family's decision along with a patient's decision. And the reason I say that is that my husband had cancer and he um, didn't have metastatic cancer. And I can tell you that there was incredible pressure from the insurance companies to put him on hospice, even at a stage two level. Um, additionally, there were treatments that would have prolonged his life. And they, the way the physicians had presented those treatments was such that they did not necessarily want him to go into those treatments. They wanted him to take other treatments because basically um, they were being paid more. So, and I even had one physician say that that treatment, the one that I wanted him to be on, and I have a medical background, um, didn't pay well. Therefore, they wanted him to go on to this different treatment. And so finally, you know, with a lot of discussion, we did end up getting him on that treatment. And he went to live on um, three and a half more years. But I can just tell you that the common person isn't going to know enough to be able to make those decisions. You need a medical background or somebody that is going to be an advocate for you that has the medical background to be able to look into the data and really parse out what is, what is the facts. Because the way things were presented is totally different than what the facts were. Yeah, and uh, I, I'm a strong believer in patient advocates and that when we have friends and loved ones who are ill, that, that if we do have those some knowledge that we can offer to be of assistance to people, uh, because there are many who don't have those kinds of um, experiences or backgrounds to be able to do it. It also highlights the importance of second opinions. Uh, and, and I think the internet has a wonderful opportunity. I think there's more and more opportunity now that we are online for people to do their own kind of research. People have to be their own advocates. There is no way out of being your own advocate uh, because the old days of uh, just being able to say, I put myself under the doctor's care and I'll do whatever she says, I think is over. 
I think those days are gone because there are, and, and think about the doctor's perspective. He is being told or she is being told, well, you've got 12 minutes per patient, you know? Uh, so it becomes, it becomes a very a difficult circumstance, which brings me back to the point I made at the beginning, that if we go into a coercive model, it will utterly destroy trust because people will think this doctor did it to get paid more, even if he or she did not do it to get paid more. They will say, well, they're getting rid of grandma because she's 85 and isn't paying taxes anymore. Uh, and it will turn us against each other because uh, how many times have I certainly heard it where people look at somebody who's expensive to care for and now they think, well, that's coming out of my pocket. So I think we have to be very, very careful in this field. And the principles we establish here at the end of life, one of the reasons I get so involved in this, and I even support people whose decisions I completely disagree with, is that it, once you set the, the principle that these death panels that, for want of a better term, can decide about somebody in the ICU, then they're going to be able to decide about other issues as well. So can you get the last word? All right. So like this, like this uh, second-year student over here, I went to Georgetown. I got both for, both for law school and for graduate school in bioethics. And you, learn, you read a lot about patient self-determination and autonomy. Um, but, at, but you're right. When you get to the real world, you learn um, informed consent sucks, right? I mean, it really does in implementation. And absolutely, right, on, what, why don't you go to on, one oncologist, they're telling you why. If you had gone to a different one, they would tell you. X, right, and it's, there's all this variability in not only what's presented, but how it's presented, how it's framed. Um, so two things, again, one th good thing about the Affordable Care Act, the Sunshine Act does require disclosures, right, so you can find out if, you're, if your physician is being paid um, by a certain drug manufacturer, if, you know, if there's a financial conflict of interest. And second, like I was saying about the patient decision aids, um, those will be certified, right, so, so um, HHS, Secretary Sebelius, um, is supposed to certify certain, uh, somebody to certify the decision aids, right? And so the idea that you wouldn't have to rely upon your individual oncologists and their own biases um, and their own treatment preferences and their own conflicts of interest because this, this um, based on evidence-based medicine, we would have developed um, some, some brochures and videos and interactive websites which a broad consensus panel has decided fairly presents all of the alternatives um, and risks and benefits of all the treatments. And so you wouldn't have, and hopefully in the future, when we use decision aids more, certified decision aids, we, you won't have the, you know, that uh, idiosyncratic uh, presentation of options that you had. And wouldn't it be nice if Hollywood started presenting these issues realistically instead of uh, fantasy land of, oh, oh, he's alive. I mean, we need to, people need to see what this is really about in real life. And I think uh, our popular culture has a lot to play, a potential lot to play in that. Uh, more realistic depictions of what happens in these ICUs. Yeah, but my question really is, is how, so the insurance company was calling from day one. So they've employed nurses to actually try to convince the patient and their family to put the patient on hospice very early after diagnosis. So where does that, I mean, that is a whole other you know, that's a, issue. Yeah, that's a, that's a very difficult issue, but there's another problem that uh, in the late 90s, something called Project Restore Trust, the government started to assume that any patient that was on hospice that didn't die within six months was a fraud, and they started going after hospices uh, for refunds in the millions and millions of dollars. And I, that happened to me when I was volunteering, and I saw the chilling effect on people being unable to get into hospices precisely because uh, uh, the uh, hospices were afraid that the government would assume that they were trying to commit a felony. Um, I think getting rid of that line divides, uh, but, but putting somebody, or trying to get your husband on hospice that early in the disease I hope is an anomaly and an exception and not a rule, because if it's a rule, it needs to be dealt with and dealt with strongly. Uh, we're going to have to stop. Uh, we're going to have another 15-minute uh, break before our final session. I want to thank our guests.